Welcome back to this episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. Today, our guest is someone who I've been wanting to interview for a very long time. This man is a mentor to many. He's a business leader in the Tampa Bay business community, and he's accomplished some pretty surprising things in his life. Rolf, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Court. Happy to be here. I think uh, what I'd love to do is talk a little bit about some of the amazing things you've accomplished in your career and in your life. Uh, I think I think uh, it would be really surprising to people to hear some of the things you've actually gotten done. Um, the one that comes to mind right off the bat is moving the Army Navy game from Philadelphia to Pasadena, California, to the Rose Bowl. How in the world did you pull that off? Well, uh, I still reflect on it uh, many, many times because it was certainly one of those things that everybody said to me, it can't be done. And it started in uh, my family room um, in uh, California, and we were watching the Army-Navy game, and I made the comment to the people that were in the room. I said, they really should move that game around the country. And somebody uh, popped up and said, can't be done. And I said, don't tell me that. Um, and uh, as In-laws. <laughs> yeah. So as as a result of that challenge, if you will, um, I engaged in a process uh, which was pretty laborious, uh, where I had to set up a whole group of, of meetings with key decision makers uh, and put together a reason for why the game should move in the first place. So I found an Achilles heel in all of that. And both of the academies were, were uh, uh, sort of subpar in terms of uh, their program. And the second part was that uh, Philadelphia was getting a little cranky because uh, the attendance wasn't there. Right. Uh, and so my compelling component was had several factors associated with it. One, uh, what could we do to ramp up attendance uh, at the game itself? Yeah. Two, there was a hidden component, and that is that the academies were not that well known west of the Mississippi. So for recruiting purposes, to get new uh, cadets, new midshipmen, uh, they were not as well known um, on the West Coast. So uh, somehow or another, I banded together a uh, meeting starting with the Secretary of the Air Force, who, as it turned out, was a uh, personal friend. And he, in turn, introduced me to the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of Defense, and I got meetings with all of them, uh, which is mind-blowing all by itself. Well, it helps to probably that you were a lieutenant colonel. Yeah, that probably helped. Um <laughs> But at the same time, I think that the Secretary of the Air Force, who was from uh, Pasadena, oh. uh, could see the benefit to Pasadena of having the game there. Sure. Uh, I already had a contact system in place uh, through, uh, through West Point. It wasn't too hard to get a contact at the Naval Academy. So I set up meetings with, with the leadership. Uh, downstream, I got even more audacious because I had to uh, figure out how I was going to get them, how I was going to put together the, the money to do it. So I put together a plan, and um, I ran it up the flagpole literally and figuratively, and uh, it was approved in March of uh, 1983. Um, I had done this over the space of less than uh, roughly a little over a year uh, between games uh, to put the proposal together and to get approval to to do it. That's amazing. So you're you're literally watching the game. And what what made you feel like it should be moved? Was it just the idea, hey, it should go other places or were you looking at the TV going, man, there's not a lot of people in the stands? A combination of all of the above, you know, as a, as a graduate, uh, number one, I know I knew the need uh for uh, for attendance at at the game uh if it was going to get any sort of uh, visibility. Uh, I also knew that uh, the uh, the city of Pasadena was sort of struggling with uh, what to do other than being perceived as a um, one day out of the year event. Which, of course, is the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl. And um, to this day, I'm still an honorary <laughs> lifetime member of the Tournament of Roses. Uh, the other compelling component in there is that uh, when I was hired as the CEO of the Pasadena Chamber of Commerce, my mission was to do something about um, jumpstarting the business community, uh, getting more activity, and getting away from the notion that you can come to Pasadena um, on one day during the course of the year. What else are you going to do, Rolf? Uh, so right. there are a whole group of factors that came into play. It was advantageous to, to Pasadena. It was going to be advantageous to the academies for recruiting purposes, 
Um, and it was going to be advantageous in terms of attendance because the city of um, Philadelphia um, really wasn't putting much effort behind the game. From their perspective, right. okay, somebody's out there in the stadium day. Who is it and what's going on? And they weren't paying a lot of attention. Right. They're paying attention now. Well, that, that was going to be my next question is, I think the game has moved back to Philadelphia, correct? As a result of moving the game, uh, subsequent contracts since uh, 1983 mm -hmm. have had a stipulation that says that uh, they've got to allow the game to move away from Philadelphia uh, once every five years. Oh. So this has been going on uh, to this date. Uh, there's a little bit of a, of a shift all of a sudden where uh, there's a new agreement allowing them to go away from Philadelphia multiple times before returning back to Philadelphia. Gotcha. So they're sort of test driving that. So they found other locations for the game. Uh, Baltimore is, uh, has always been a, a destination. New York has tended to be a destination. They've been to Washington, and over the next couple of years, they're going to run it up to Boston. Um, but it's j basically centered on the East Coast, because it's difficult to move 10,000 people right. it's, it's, anywhere. It's mind-boggling the logistics involved in actually moving such a big event like that. Well, the bottom line is that uh, it was the largest movement uh, in peacetime history um, on this course of just a, less than a day. So I had to move 10,000 people from uh, the Naval Academy in Annapolis and, and from um, West Point, uh, all of them into the Los Angeles uh, airport and somehow figure out a way to do it uh, seamlessly. I mean, if you look at the uproar over these winter storms right now um, and you get a better handle on how difficult it is to move people, right. uh, never mind connect a lot of dots. Uh, I had to use two airports. Um, I have found a way to meet the, uh, the, the uh, president and chief operating officer for United Airlines. Uh, I don't know how I got in his door, but I did. Uh, and got a sweetheart deal from him to move um, both the Corps of Cadets and the Brigade of Midshipmen. Uh, unfortunately, when they changed the date of the game, and this occurred um, uh, in April of 1983, the agreement was signed in March. In April, uh, the TV, the NCAA were meeting with uh, the various uh, networks to determine which network was going to have the Army-Navy game. Uh, and in their infinite wisdom, because the records were so bad, they decided to change it from the Saturday after Thanksgiving, or the first, I'm sorry, the first Saturday in December, to the Friday, Friday after Thanksgiving. Mm. Uh, and that blew a hole in my uh, my plan to move because it's the busiest uh, day of the year in terms of travel. travel because people want to go home or wherever they want to go for Thanksgiving. So I lost half of my lift. Oh, wow. Uh, so I had to get creative all over again and find a way to band it together and make it work. Well, you kind of remind me of, uh, to use a football analogy, like Barry Sanders. You know, Rolf will not be denied. Like he's going to juke left, come right, gets thrown a curveball. He's going to, you know, somehow find his way to make a few yards. That seems like it's a part of who you are when I look at your career and the things that you've accomplished over the years. It seems like it's a, a common theme when it comes to you. And and what what is it in you that that uh, makes it to where you just you just won't be denied? Like, why are you how, how can you be so persistent? You know, I really can't point to a particular time in my life, although I think I can. And as I think back a little bit. Uh, as a kid, I was like every other kid, just doing whatever I was supposed to be doing, going to school and, and whatever. Um, you know, I did engage in some sports um, in in high school, uh, but I think it was in high school when I was starting to do several things. One, um, I played tennis. Uh, I was on the swim team. I was on the debate team. And somehow what clicked in is uh, the competitive side of me. Mm -hmm. And I learned what competition was all about. And I probably learned it in sports, and then I learned it through debate at some level. Um, but I think the trigger was uh, when I decided, and I decided this at the age of nine. Um, we had, were living in uh, New Jersey. My father was a consulting engineer in New York City. Uh, we took a trip up to West Point. And at the age of nine, I looked around, I said, I want to do this. Do you mind me asking me what, what year that was? Um, <laughs> 1939. 
Wow. So this is, this is, I'm just, the reason I'm asking is for context of like what's going on in the world at that time, right? 1930, before the Second World War. Right. And um, so we went up there and I decided like any kid today, but not at nine, nine years of age. Typically, you know, when a kid is hits the junior year, you start going to the various campuses and seeing what, what your college decision is. And the stupid part is too many decisions are made based on brick and mortar. Um, and God, this is a cool place. Uh, instead of yeah. looking behind the brick and mortar and what's going on there. Right. So there were really two things at play for me. The brick and mortar, of course, was very imposing. But I saw the cadets and I saw things there that said, I think this is something that I want to do, and this is a place that I want to go. Um, when I applied in my first year, um, I did not get in. I was the first alternate. Mm. And the way they stacked up the decision-making is that your member of Congress came up with a principal and three alternates. Over the years, it's changed somewhat. Uh, I found myself as the first alternate. He got in. That meant I was toast. Yeah. So I had to start all over again. <clears throat> I think that was really the trigger because I was determined to figure out a way to get in there, whatever it took. Yeah, how'd you do it? And, um, well, um, I took a year of uh, junior college, mm. and at the same time, I explored every possible avenue to get into West Point. At the, in, and I was going after the congressional appointment. I was going after a senatorial appointment. Love it. Uh, but in addition to that, I applied for about a half a dozen colleges and universities in California. Mm. I applied for UCLA, USC, Stanford. Uh, I ran the table on every one of them. And what's interesting is that uh, I got accept accepted at every one of them, and I had appointments for both West Point and the Naval Academy as a result, which wow. taught me something. And that is don't follow a single path. Have, have alternates going. Have other courses of action working. And every time I've done that, it's been successful. If I get on a single track, it's a disaster. Right. Yeah. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, right? Yeah. And there's a corollary many, many years later. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we decided to take the Trans-Canada uh, Rail uh, from Toronto to, uh, to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. What most people don't know, it's most of the distance, it's single rail. Mm. until you get to a, a place where they have dual rail. And then you're, if you're in a, um, a, a passenger train as opposed to a freight, you get to wait for the freight. They get priority. Oh, wow. And so that brought back this whole thing. Always have another course of action. In that particular case, there is no course of action unless you want to walk, and that's not a good idea. Well, I think one of the things that I've seen in my career is when you have a single course of action or you've, you know, basically painted yourself in the corner. If things don't go your way, what it can do is it can put pressure on you to make decisions that you wouldn't make otherwise. Exactly. And so it, it can kind of put pressure on your integrity and things like that. And so I've always, I've always tried to um, create an environment or have multiple channels that you know pass we I can take, so that way I can always behave in the most ethical in a manner. And I think that's really important to leadership. It is, it is crucial to leadership. Uh, and just because I got to my first objective, that doesn't, didn't mean that the, the competition stopped. Oh, right. It really got started because I looked around, I said, you're not the hot, hot shot that you think you are. You know, there are 800 other hot shots just like you. Mm -hmm. So the competition started all over again. Oh, right. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as you get in there. So how did you perform at West Point? Um, I uh, got into uh, athletics. Mm -hmm. I got into debate. I went with some of my uh, my strengths. And so as a result of that, was able to do some pretty cool things. I was on the Army tennis team. Uh, I played squash. I was on the Army uh, debate team. And uh, in one instance, and this was sort of a high point, um, the United States was asked to send a team to McGill University in Canada for an international debate. And uh, West Point was selected, and uh, my partner and I were selected to, to go up there um, and debated at, uh, with a couple of graduate students uh, at McGill University. That's a really cool honor. I mean, I can't think of a better place to develop your leadership skills than in a university known for developing leadership skills like West Point. And then you took that experience and you parlayed it into a successful career in the military. Yeah, I really credit West Point for shaping me. Uh, the honor code, uh, you know, is crucial. Uh, building trust is crucial. Uh, all the leadership skills that you need to be an effective leader 
And more importantly, and you don't see this today as much as uh, I saw it then, is if you're going to be a leader, you have to be a role model. A lot of people don't get that part. Right. That's right. They think they don't differentiate or they can't differentiate between leading and managing. And too many of them are managing, not leading. Yeah, it is. It is a very difficult concept to grasp for some people. And it's something that I'm passionate about learning. And I always try to think, like, how could I be a better leader constantly? Right. Because it's impossible to manage when the organization that you're involved in gets so large, you know, except for just a handful of people. Right. But you can all you can be a leader to everybody. And uh, which, you know, obviously you are the chair of Vistage Florida. Um, it's well known as a leadership organization, a peer group of CEOs. How did you get involved in Vistage? Uh, it, you have to think back to an experience I had um, as a Boy Scout. Um, in Boy Scout, once a Boy Scouts, once a year, uh, you would line up, uh, and they have a big outdoor fire. Um, and somebody came down behind the line of, of scouts to determine whether you should be a part of what they called uh, the order, of the uh, uh, order of the arrow. Uh, and the differentiator there is that uh, the scouts typically wear a, wear a kerchief of some kind and a sort of nondescript. Um, pin that goes over that scarf. The order of the arrow, you have this red arrow and you wear a yellow scarf. It's very distinctive and you're part of something that's select and different. Mm. And so every year they go down and, and they come in behind you and you could just feel the hair on the back of your neck go up and they disappear and you kind of slump. Right. Uh, one year they stopped behind me, put uh, both hands on my shoulders three times and uh, pulled me out. I was now a member of the order of the arrow. That's really cool. Through my career, um, you keep waiting for somebody to tap you on the shoulder. Now, in the military, it doesn't happen quite like that um, because uh, you get your assignments uh, that come to you through uh, through West Point. Could you argue that's ta being tapped on? Not necessarily. Uh, in the civilian world, uh, does somebody give you a call and say, we'd like to talk to you about <laughs> no one uh, does. a position? No, nah. you have to make your own way. So what happened here to your question is that uh, somebody approached me and said, you know, we think that you would be a good chair for what was then called tech and is now today called Vistage. Somebody had tapped me on the shoulder. Gotcha. And so you got involved in Vistage and now locally, famously, you lead three groups Three groups, uh, 61 people under wing, uh, which is a bucket load. Well, that's what I meant by your mentor to many, even out beyond Vistage. You do get quite a unique insight into the business environment. I mean, to be working with most of the time Vistage per members are, you know, they have to meet certain qualifications for their business. I mean, you're talking about a one in a thousand type of a business, and now you're helping to mentor and to lead and to facilitate um, conversations and, and continuous study and whatnot and share ideas between your members and your groups of 61. That's a, that probably represents billions of dollars in terms of, you know, the revenue that yeah, those if companies you, if you If you took it, drilled it all the way down uh, past the CEO or past uh, that uh, senior executive to all of their direct reports, uh, it comes out to, you know, 10, 20,000 people are, are impacted in one way or another, never mind the dollars associated with it. So uh, the impact goes pretty deep. And I understand that. Um, but every day is a learning experience. But the bigger thing that I get, and you touched on it real well, is that uh, when I have a meeting, um, it's almost a litmus test of what's going on in the economy. Mm -hmm. Because I'm getting 61 perspectives from um, a multitude of industries um, and just about every sector that you can imagine to make up a, a business community. So once a month, I get the pulse uh, right. just in the group meeting. Uh, then we have the one-on-one -on -one sessions and we go even deeper. So it could be argued a meeting is a mile wide and an inch deep. A one-on-one -on -one tends yeah, to be an inch wide and a mile deep. A lot deeper. So a lot of people have said, and I get, I have a personal feeling too, that we're at an inflection point in the economy at this moment what are you seeing out there and what should other people be aware of? Uh, a survey recently completed suggested that over 85% of CEOs across the country see Q1 of 23 and beyond as a period of uncertainty. 
number one. Mm -hmm. So they're exercising extreme caution. A lot of them are looking at Q1 of 23 as a um, replay, an instant replay of the quarter we're just now completing. In some instances, they're dialing back to Q1 of, of 2022. They're budgeting very, very conservatively. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they're cautiously uh, setting sales targets 3 to 5% above that level because you could ill afford to fall short of budget but you need to be someplace between your sales goal and your actual budget goal. Um, assumptions right now are, are based on a couple of things. One, um, there is cash on the sidelines and people are trying to figure out how to deploy it. Right. So the good news here in, in Tampa and in, in Florida that our economy is 100% different than a California, New York, a Mississippi, a Nebraska, whatever it is. Yeah, where a place people want to be. We've been very, very fortunate. So the profitability is there, but the caution lights are still on. Right. Uh, margins are being squeezed uh, because of uh, increased uh, salaries, cost of goods, um, supply chain issues. So um, a lot of folks right now are concerned about their margins and protecting those, which is, which is understandable. Um, people have found, and particularly over this last month, a certain amount of malaise crept in. And whether people felt that uh, you can't fire me because you can't replace me, there's a lot of that going on. And so performance took a dive during the last quarter. Mm -hmm. So I'm advising everybody going into January of this next year to do a couple of things. One, look at themselves and ask themselves about their personal self-discipline. Mm -hmm. Are they disciplined? Are they making the right decisions? Uh, what, is the, what are they as a role model? What picture are you getting of, of your CEO? And so if that CEO is constantly off playing golf or fishing or doing something or barely present, whatever it is, that that behavior is going to get modeled. Absolutely, it will. Uh, the other thing I'm charging them to do is to hold their people more accountable. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and inherent in that, I'm suggesting everybody needs to have a reboot. There is an expectation going into new year that something's going to change. Don't disappoint. Not much is going to change. It's it's next week. Uh, yeah. It's it's next month. Never mind that it's next year. That's a that's a good target for the CPA and the IRS, but it means nothing to the rest of us. Yeah. Every day is just comes is another day. But what to expect next year? Um, I would say that um, uh, caution is is uh, probably the uh, overriding uh, consideration. Uh, at the same time, they realize that they got to ramp up their marketing. They right. got to build on their brand. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't cut out of their budgets those things that they think are easy to cut, whether it's advertising or training. Sure. And training is crucial. Um, training is crucial. And what I'm hearing across the board, uh, all three groups, they're going to be hiring next year, not to add, to replace. That's crucial because they're fed up with poor performance. And uh, at some point, it's going to come back and bite us. The only question is when. The problem is that somebody is fired and says, okay, fine. It's pretty easy to get another job somewhere right. else. That's changing. The jury is out on that one. Yeah. The jury is out on that one. So companies are tightening up. Uh, they're demanding uh, greater levels of, of expectation. Um, across the board, whether you take a look at uh, the banking community or you look at uh, food service, or manufacturing, and every one of those cases, uh, we've been very fortunate over this last year. Um, what people are going to be doing is anybody's guess, but subsequent to COVID, everybody, you know, the genie was out of the bottle. Everybody went running off, running around, jumping on planes and trains and buses and getting their car going somewhere, right. putting up with obnoxious pricing. Uh, hotels were charging you twice as much as they normally would, and you're getting half as much in return. I think that's going to bite the hotel industry next year. Uh, where uh, people are not going to put up with that. Uh, you're going to see a reduction in business travel because of uh, um, other methods that you can use, whether it's Team or Zoom, and people are going to cut back on that one. Uh, most people have now run through the cash that they uh, had in hand after a couple of years of, of COVID and they're into their credit cards, yeah. and they're going to have to crank back. Uh, it depends on what part of the economic spectrum you're on. The upper end, you know, it won't bother. They won't bother them quite so much. It's middle America and the low end; those that are on hourly wage, uh, where they're going to feel the biggest pinch. So, if you're selling to that middle group or below, 
you need to really be do a good job of explaining your value. Yeah, and that's crucial, the value equation. What am I getting for my dollar? Right. Um, everybody's keenly <clears throat> aware of the inflation rates uh, and how this is going to play out is, is anybody's guess. It just costs more. But uh, wages and salaries are, are moving at roughly the same speed. So uh, we've just moved the thing up a notch. Have you seen a cycle? You've seen a lot of business cycles. Have you seen a cycle similar to this one? Does not this really. remind you of anything? No. Uh, not really. Um, you know, we went from, I guess, the th biggest thing I've seen in my lifetime, and uh, there's an economic uh, book uh, written by a guy named, I think, Paul Samuel Samuelson. The uh, thing is about that thick. <laughs> Um, he talks about a gun and guns and butter economy. Okay. And so during a, the Second World War, during the Korean War, during the Vietnam War, mm. there was a boost in activity driven primarily by the defense industry. Sure. Um, butter economy means it's more of a peacetime. Gotcha. We are now moving back into more of a peacetime economy. That changes things. And the defense industry is not going to drive the train. It's going to come from other sectors. Right. If I had to guess on sector, I'd say it'd be on leisure. Hmm. Well, that's something that we're definitely going to be paying very close attention to. I hope, I hope that um, I, I do like what you're saying in terms of some of the service industries out there becoming, you know, becoming more competitive, right? I, I want some of these services. I mean, I think uh, I used to get a Starbucks coffee, <laughs> you know, every day. It was part of my routine, but there's no way I'm paying six dollars for a cup of coffee now it's unbelievable right i'm making coffee at home uh i just don't see the value there right um and that, what you're saying about travel and whatnot um certainly looking forward to that i was looking at uh you know what am i going to do for spring break with my family this year and uh the vrbo rental that we were looking at was outrageous and so we're we're making a decision to do do other things than probably going to go check out that uh, that you know destination vacation. So uh, I can certainly see what you're talking about as being uh, reading the tea leaves and seeing what's going on out there. I think it's super important to explain your value and and get the word out there, broaden your audience of who you're talking to about what it is that you do. No, you're 100 percent right on on the value component. And as people see prices go up, they have second thoughts. Um, and I think that a lot of the cash has been burned uh, on the part of middle America. At the other end where uh, they've been waiting to, to do something, how do you best today deploy cash? Mm -hmm. uh, more and more companies are trying to build reserves because they don't know what to expect. Gotcha. Well, tell me a little bit more about what's going on with you these days. You stay super busy. You um, obviously are, you know, advanced in terms of your experience in life, right? But I can't imagine, like, I hope, I hope that I live as long as you do. I, I can't imagine. I mean, the, the odds are I won't, you know, but you stay super busy. You're incredibly sharp. You said some of the funniest things I've ever heard in the last two years at different <laughs> meetings and places I've been with you. How do you stay so on top of things? You know, I think that uh, every day I ask myself, what can I do better? Um, I'm on the road at 6.20 in the morning. My first appointment typically is around six, uh, around 7.30, uh, and I run a whole bunch of appointments. And what I found is pretty basic to me, at least, mm -hmm. and that is if I'm going, if I'm going to uh, uh, continue to be relevant and not find myself sitting on the sidelines, right. then I have to stay engaged. And that acts as a stimulus and gets me energized. Um, and if I can make something happen or help somebody to make something happen, uh, I'm a happy camper as a result of it. So to maintain my mental acuity right. and my physical fitness, I stay engaged uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with people. That's where mental acuity comes into play. Uh, I'm a voracious uh, reader of information so that I get a good handle or somewhat of a good handle on what's going on. Physically, I'm out every, uh, every weekend on the golf course. Um, I'm a lifetime, uh, tennis player, but unfortunately, uh, between, uh, the infantry and, uh, tennis, uh, my knees are a disaster. So I had to shift over to golf. Have you tried pickleball? Not yet. Um, as we speak, I'm, um, uh, doing some injections on my knees, mm -hmm. uh, to see if I can get back to my, uh, my battle rhythm. 
Yeah. Um, and if I can get that back, I'm going to, I'm going to test drive uh, that, uh, for right now it's, it's going to be golf. Yeah. Well, th- that's talk about a challenge. <laughs> golf is always a challenge. I don't care how good you are. Well, it tells you something. Uh, it's a word we always use. And I think we stole it from golf. Keep your eye on the ball. Right. Tennis is the same thing. Um, when I played, uh, uh, tennis and I think back at an experience in, uh, when I was in Pasadena and I was playing with uh, some pretty top lev- level people, this uh, one guy would scream at himself from time to time, regarde le ball, regarde le ball, which of course is French. Which is French. Look at the ball. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I get that loud and clear. Uh, my mantra in, uh, in tennis is that because I played both tennis and squash at, mm-hmm. at West Point, it kind of made a, a create a disaster on um, on my forehand. Yeah. And I found instead of using a tennis swing, the racket all the way back, I would snap at it. Yeah. But because of the squash, I could get that ball up to 100 miles an hour. Oh, my heavens. That's and, really fast. And so uh, my, my primary shot was right down the sidelines, and some poor double was in front of me looking at me. He had several choices, either get out of the way or eat the ball. Yeah, well, I love that. I love. I can, I pick up on the the competitive vibes, man. It's, it gets me. It gets me going too. I love that. I love uh, uh, talking well, that was to people a, that love to win. It was a relief mechanism for me too, because people sure. know me that I use a I use something physical to get rid of a mental. So yeah. as a case in point, and the people that work for me knew this. Uh, I would put names on ball, on the tennis ball. (laughs) And so when on a Friday and and everybody would go home for the weekend, you know, the staff would look at me and say, is my name on one of those balls? said, not only for for one game, it may continue for the entire set. But it forced me to look at the ball. And it got rid of any internal tension. It was was a stupid thing. But it was part of the competitive thing and part of a physical relief. Probably aided a lot in your relationships with William, uh, and uh, Wilson and Penn as yeah. well. You probably always had great relationships with people with those names. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's great. Well, one of the things, the last thing I'd like to talk about today is, you know, you and I are involved in uh, a group called Star that I'm, it's, it's the thing I'm most proud of outside of the office. And it gives me a lot of joy to help some of these elite special forces guys who are retiring from, you know, we have, the base here in Tampa Bay where a lot of these guys come through and uh, they're looking to retire in the Tampa Bay area. And it's our job to learn about and help them through that transition process. How has that been for you? It's a great experience because I see myself some years ago when I made the decision to shift from a military career to a civilian career. Uh, And it's a difficult slope. You're changing your culture. Uh, you're in an environment that you're not familiar with. Uh, your skill sets um, are completely different, yet they, they are transferable. So I know uh, exactly what they're going through, and uh, I also know all the mistakes and the dumb stuff that I did along the way where I made a bad decision, either right. in terms of the job that I accepted or how I performed the job. And if I can help somebody else to not make the mistakes that I made, then I feel rewarded. Yeah, well, I, I like I was saying, I get I get a lot of value out of that because it's just the joy of giving back, and it seems like you live a life of giving back. It seems like that is like your top priority, most and, emphatically. And I, I think that everyone who gets to interact with you really appreciates you for that. Well, I um, uh, it drives me every day, and you pointed out something a minute ago that caused me to think about something, and that is a. I, it could be argued that I'm statistically dead, um, but right now my goal is, uh, I look at 95, which is a couple of years out, uh, as a pit stop on the way to 100. Heck yeah. And so um, I guess I'm the engineer of the battery that keeps chugging along. You're in better shape than most people I know who are in their 70s. <laughs> I try like, to be. Like you're you're killing it. So mm-hmm. um, uh also, I think it's very important, and you just touched on not make some of the mistakes you made. You wrote a book called How to Start Everything and Finish Nothing. And on its on the f- face of the book, you would think, it's like, hey, this is about Rolf. But actually, that book is filled with things that you did finish and you did accomplish. And so it is a little bit of a, s- a surprise when you start reading it. it is about, it's a book designed to help people who 
or not finishing, who are not, who start things, but don't get them completed. And I got a ton of value out of your book. And uh, I would encourage anybody listening to this to check out your book. And uh, I believe it's available on Amazon. Yes, it is. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, it's on just about every platform. And and I did a did a, a voice version of an audio version, which was enlightening of and by itself. That's great. Well, Rolf, I really enjoyed having you here today and having this conversation. It's like I said, it's an interview I've been wanting to do for a very long time. And uh and I'm looking forward to uh to knowing you as we get through 95 and, and, and hit 100. I hope uh, I hope I get to come to those birthday parties. Well, I, absolutely. You're number one on the guest list. I'm looking forward to it as well. <laughs> That's awesome. Where can people follow you? Where can people keep up with what you're up to? Uh, I've got a website, uh, you know, rolfbooks.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and Rolf is spelled R-O-L-F-E. Yeah, and I joke with that a little bit. Uh, conventional wisdom, most people aren't ready for R-O-L-F-E. So I tell people that the family bought an E. (laughs) That's good. Well, thank you again for coming in. And you can follow us anywhere where podcasts are found on all of the Bake More Pies social media and on thelawofrelevancy.com. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next time.